Next, we are gonna have Robin um, do our presentation here. He is gonna talk to you about cybersecurity and Robin, I will let you take it from here. Uh, great, thanks so much, Amy, and it's a pleasure to be here today with everyone at CMG. I'm uh, going to talk about what we're presently doing with a lot of our customers in the cyber protection space for mainframe, and uh, and it's a very uh, exciting new development uh, that I kind of view as really the next level of DR. Cyber events themselves are become a pretty much everyday occurrence these days, right? There's always something coming up in the news uh, about the latest hack or ransomware incidents and so on. What's sort of interesting about how this is evolving is um, when we talk to executives and ask them what their concerns are, virtually every organization has significant concern in this area. Um, matter of fact, even um, our Federal Reserve Chairman on 60 Minutes a couple of weeks ago mentioned that this is an area that he thinks has tremendous risk for the recovery of our economy as we emerge out of COVID. And probably what's more interesting is, um, at least in my mind, is uh, executives worry about their ability to actually recover from these types of events. And when you look at the mainframe specifically, um, mainframe is a, it is truly a very secure environment, but it's like any other computer system. It has, um, you know, threats that can be exploited, uh, weaknesses that can be exploited. And, and, you know, they typically are the systems of record for, for, you know, banks and insurance companies and governments and so on. And in mainframe, typically um, it's a little bit different concern maybe than what we see in open systems, but but um, people with knowledge, unique knowledge and, and high levels of authority. Um, and then, you know, basically uh, phishing attacks and so on, you know, basically credential um, stealing, things like that are one of the key ways of getting entry into a mainframe environment you know, breaches through phishing. Then of course we worry about insiders because of their capabilities or knowledge that they have. Um, Dell's been doing this for some time now. Um, we introduced some very specific technology to help customers protect data uh, in the mainframe space uh, as, you know, as early as 2016. And we'll talk about some of the considerations around cyber and, and what, um, you'd want to at least think about no matter what choices you make in terms of your technology provider. But we've been working on this for a while. It's an evolving area of interest for our customers. And we view this as really as the next step of basically mainframe recovery, you know, business continuity recovery now has grown to include cyber. And we're very good um, as an industry protecting mainframes and allow rapid recovery um, from DR type events, which are, you know, generally infrastructure related. But, you know, now we, we're trying to address these needs uh, and recovery requirements around the data itself, you know, whether they manifest themselves externally or through insider threat. Of course, we do have a full portfolio of technology that can be applied to the mainframe platform infrastructure. And we uh, you know, are ensuring that as we move forward that, you know, we still focus on resiliency and recovery. So what are some of the specific technologies that we use to help customers be able to protect their information in this new uh, wild west of cyber? Um, well, traditionally, again, we've always focused on DR. Um, we are focused on infrastructure, you know, but the cyber environment is really around the data itself rather than the uh, lower level hardware infrastructure. You know, if you look at disaster recovery, you know, we talk about zero data loss, uh, maybe no impact for site failover. You know, if you do have to fail over and restart very rapid recovery, uh, you know, minimizing data loss and so on, or eliminating it. With cyber, um, it's a little bit different. It may not be obvious that you've had an event immediately. Um, it's guaranteed you will lose data. That's the nature of the event. Um, and then again, um, may not be cyber, but when you talk about data, you know, this allows you an opportunity to protect against different kinds of events that we don't really cover with disaster recovery, such as human error, or maybe some forms of processing errors. So when we look at our offerings that we have here, you know, there's a couple pieces that are really core to allowing you to protect the data. 
first and foremost is being able to use very space efficient snapshotting technology. So the idea here is you want to be able to do a consistent point in time image of your environment that's restartable. You want to have um, lots of granularity. You know, you want to minimize the data loss. So you want to be able to do snapshots very, very frequently. Lots of them. And of course, you need the space efficiency to be there so you can have data retained for a longer period of time. Typically, when we think about DR protection, we use snapshots as part of that scheme. You're really talking about something that gets rotated on a 24-hour basis. When we talk about cyber, we're thinking about like five-minute granularity, maybe one or two weeks of protection of the, of the disk infrastructure. For tape, we think about maybe 90 days or 100 days. Um, and then, of course, rapidly be able to access these snapshots and make use of them. The course, making snapshots in themselves is only one part of a solution. The next part would be automating the processes, making it very easy for humans to deploy and support and, and manage over time. And we do that with the automation technology that we developed called ZDP, Data Protector for Z Systems, that runs on a mainframe environment. Also, because of the unique skill sets we have in this space, you know, there's concern around insiders um, either acting maliciously on their own or potentially coercion. Um, you know, so we need to be able to protect against people that do have special skill sets. So, so we've evolved the solution to basically require, or not require, but provide you the ability to leverage two actor security. What this basically means is one person can't execute on their own um, and disrupt either your method of protecting your data or potentially um, destroying the data you already have, or maybe um, implementing some sort of a restore action that's not authorized. So um, basically, if you want to do something around the cyber environment, you basically have to get it authorized by another specific actor. So again, we're trying to protect against people with specialized skill sets or knowledge. So what's brought us to this point? Well, to know what we're doing now, you, we take a quick look at the past. So in the past, and what we do today for disaster recovery, this is a very typical topology. You see a three-site region A and B implementation here. Region A is typically um, two data centers within synchronous replication distance. Maybe they're a pod design where it's really two halves of a data center facility that's very hardened. And then of course you have your outer region recovery uh, B. You have HA locally, asynchronous replication, outer region, the ability to basically incrementally refresh data to any one of those positions. And we've been doing this for quite a long time. This is very standard um, disaster recovery capability these days. Of course, if you do have a disaster on one of your environments like region A here, primary, we can transparently without disruption, no data loss, resume processing on um, the local mirrored pair. Of course, if you have a region disaster where I lose both machines, um, we would do a restart out of region with minimal data loss, because it's asynchronously, maybe two, three, five seconds of data loss. Um, the point is, is that your environment's protected, you have very rapid recovery, um, and, and you're able to start processing again. When we look at logical protection, same example again, I got my three site implementation, local HA, outer region restart, um, you know, synchronously locally, asynchronously remote. Now, when you look at this environment, if something happens to the data, I, something happens to the data on the primary processing facility, we instantly replicate that to its mirrored pair. Of course, um, I can't swap now because the data is bad in both places. And of course, when I go to restart out a region, um, well, just a few seconds after I corrupted the first two, I've propagated that bad data out of region. So the issue I have now is I got bad data. My infrastructure is good. My server, my mainframe processor is good. The storage is good. The networks are good, but, but the data is not. So that's really the dilemma around logical data pr protection. So it's a so it's a much more uh, fine level of um, looking at the environment than when we look at the broad strokes of the infrastructure. Of course, we've had the ability to provide some form of logical data protection. 
for years, we've been using cloning technology. Um, in the our case, Time Finder, you know, IBM Flash Copy Shadow Image from Hitachi. And these are very powerful point in time copy technologies, but typically they use a full copy of data. Also, they require addressing and, and uh, resources on their array to support. So due to the cost of capacity and limited resources of addressing and so on, typically we would use it around DR test and DR site protection if we ever have to resync. Many of our banks would have maybe two copies. So if you were using it as a form of logical protection, you'd have the ability to potentially recover 12 hours old data or maybe recover 24 hours old data. Um, obviously not very desirable um, in, a, in a mainframe environment due to the amount of data loss. And typically this is quite expensive and hard to scale if you had a very large environment. So if, if you look at thoughts around requirements for cyber, you know, again, we go back, you want the solution technology to be very space efficient. So you want really only want to consume space as is used by your applications in the most granular method possible. Uh, the most granular method for a mainframe is basically a track. So can you manage the usage of space at a track level or not? Um, of course, you want to automate the usage of your space. Um, you want to have your snapshots. You want your snapshots to be, again, very efficient in terms of how they consume space. You want to be able to have lots of snapshots and be able to run them very frequently. Um, you want your snapshots to be able to stand alone. In other words, if I make a snapshot now, I don't need, I don't want it to have to be dependent upon other snapshots I made earlier. Because if you have some sort of space issue in the environment, possibly you don't want to have the snapshot you have now potentially be affected by some other snapshot in the space requirements around that snapshot. Of course, the snapshots, you want them to be immutable. You want them to be secured so they can't be deleted. And ideally, you want them to stay immutable even if you use them. In other words, the typical point in time technology we use for protecting data, um, once you start using the image, it changes. It's no longer a gold copy. Well, it'd be ideal to may be able to maintain that gold copy. Of course, you want to be able to protect yourself against uh, knowledgeable insiders, you know, two actor security and so on. And you want to be able to do very rapid recovery. You want to limit the data movement, eliminate the data movement. So can the snapshot technology allow you to basically instantly access data or do you have to do some sort of recovery copy process first? So when you look at how we've done traditional mainframe infrastructure, this is a pretty common example. On the left side, you have a environment where we provided 200 terabytes of storage. These 100 terabytes that's defined to run the business on. We have a clone for 100 terabytes to basically make point in time backups. Typically in the production environment, you might use that for um, reducing backup impact for applications like DB2 and IMS. Um, of course, no one runs everything at 100%. So in my example, you're only using 70 terabytes of the data. Um, and the change rate's around 10% a day here. And by the way, that's not so bad in a lot of environments. You'd be surprised the data change overall is less in many cases than we used to think about it traditionally. Uh, so on the left side here, basically you're only using about um, um, you know, 77 terabytes of your data, even though you got 200 terabytes to find. So 77 terabyte, 70 terabytes used and then your daily clone of seven terabytes. For disaster recovery, um, you have a mirror of what you have on the source side. So you got a hundred terabytes to replicate the data through. I, I show two clone examples here. So I provision 300 terabytes. Again, I'm only really using 70 terabytes for protecting the business. Of course, I do my daily cloning operations. So I got 14 terabytes there. So in the DR side, I'm even less efficient than I was on production. I'm only about 28% efficient. Again, we've been doing this type of storage management allocation strategy and mainframe for a very long time. It's only recently that we're getting away from full provisioning uh, in the last five years or so. So again, when we talk about mainframe cyber, you know, there's two approaches. Mainframe's not just DASI. So DASI, we could look at very fine granularity, um, eliminate data movement, having immutable copies and so on. Um, when we talk about mainframe tape, 
mainframe tape is a little bit different where it's not live data per se. You know, you have an environment, you might have 100,000 vol sears that have been written. Um, it's very unlikely you're going to open up 100 vol sears and corrupt their data. You could certainly write a new vol sear that has bad data, but to really um, corrupt the pool, so to speak, is, is quite difficult to do because you have a limited access to the pool of vol sears due to the limited tape drives you typically have. So on DASI, we really look at protecting against real-time operations for sure and, and basically having restartable data. With tape, we're looking at making sure the tape's available when you actually do need it. So typically on disk, we might run the five-minute granularity. And on tape, we typically talk about more commonly maybe a 24-hour granularity of protection. Um, so you'll find that these requirements um, you know, are pretty common now. Now, if you happen to run your tape on our high-end PowerMax type technology, we can give you the same five-minute granularity for tape. But a lot of our customers will utilize our deduplication technology called data domain for mainframe tape, um, you know, as a, as a different backend storage option. So what's the secret here to making this thing efficient so that you can actually afford to run it? Well, first and foremost, we start with virtual provisioning of the storage. Um, this illustration here kind of gives you a, the concept that we utilize. So we have a pool of storage. It's RAID protected. It might be RAID 5 or 6. We can even do mirroring. And then you have a thin device that we make addressable to the mainframe. So that might be a Mod 54, the one at the top there. When you initialize your Mod 54 and start writing data to it, we allocate the data of that volume across that backend pool at one track at a time granularity. So that means you can never use more space than really what you're writing. The other benefit to this is you can ever have a hotspot anymore in your backend storage. So you really design mainframe storage now for an overall bandwidth requirement. You don't worry about really what can I do with a volume because it's on a set of RAID plus, you know, seven plus one RAID five volumes, for example. So now you have very efficient usage of space. Um, and that plays into what we do with the snapshotting technology. So the snapshotting technology, uh, what's unique about what we've done since moving forward with our SnapVX implementation is we eliminated the requirement of having addresses to make snapshots. So if you have a thousand volumes, and you want to make a snapshot, you just say, give me a snapshot of the thousand volumes. There are no volume addresses required to make that snapshot. We call that a targetless snapshot. The snapshots themselves are pointer based. So no data is copied. There's no copy on first write event here. If you update a volume, we write the new data and up, we'll update the location of that write for that volume. We don't have to touch any of the snapshots. Um, of course, if you want to make lots of snapshots, uh, if you do it explicitly, we do without uh, 256 snapshots. If you do it under automation, we can give you 1,024 snapshots. Then, of course, if you want to use your snapshots, you do have to link them to a volume. So we have to have some addressability in there to actually use your snapshots. But the snapshot itself is immutable. It's always a gold copy, even if you use it. Um, you can secure it, which means if you say it must be retained for seven days, it will be retained for seven days. Even someone with specialized um, security capability can't get rid of it. Um, and of course, it's very space efficient. So if you take a look at the virtual pool again, a storage, it looks kind of like this representation. So you got your standard volume on the left. That's that thin device I showed on the earlier slide. I got my snapshots that I'm creating there in the middle, 10 a.m., 12 noon. And then I got a set of devices that I would use to access the snapshot. So if I decide to access the 10 a.m. snapshot, I would link it to that target device on the upper right-hand side. If I start using that target device, the data changes on that device, but the actual snapshot is still a gold copy. Any changes you do make would be stored in the common resource pool. Again, the granularity of one track at a time. The power of this is I can do thousands of snapshots, 1,024. The overhead of having 1,000 snapshots is basically minimal because I don't have to copy the data for every single snapshot. You know, it's a redirection. If I need, want to access my snapshots, when I link them, 
Uh, they're instantly available by using the pointers. I don't have to move any data. And I can link to evaluate data, like I might use with the target device. I could do a link back to the source device if I wanted to do a restoration event. So again, that's making snapshots. How do I make them easy to consume? Well, that's where the automation comes in, Data Protector for VZ Systems. So it's a mainframe app that runs as part of our software stack. Customers will sometimes choose to run that in a cyber vault, um, or they'll run it uh, in their you know production environment as just another star task. We have ISPF panels for interfacing it. You can do batch JCL to interface to it. We even have a Unisphere based implementation that allow you man manage it off mainframe. It's really not ZDP then, but we have the same capability to do that from the user management environment of the PowerMax itself if you want to do it off mainframe through Unisphere. Again, this is how you're going to automate protecting your data. You know, um, kind of a time machine for mainframe because we're going to automatically make snapshots over and over and over again. So what's the key here? What are we really doing? Well, the key to the snapshot is the snapshot is really what creates your error gap of data. So when we talk about cyber protection, we always talk about this error gap. The error gap is this break between the ability to access your data and manipulate it, you know, or be able to access the environment from a management point of view and manipulate it. So what we do with the snapshotting technology, the snapshot itself creates this immutable point in time copy of your data. So I'm running my application, I'm replicating data, some bad data gets written. We will invariably capture some bad data with our snapshots. If I'm running these intervals, let's say every 10 minutes, in my example here, I just captured four bad intervals of data. So I got 40 minutes of bad data if I'm running a 10 minute cycle time. So I got lots of points of time here though, maybe going back a week. So I know in my example here, because I made the slide that the fifth copy is actually good. But the reality is you may not know that up front, right? So I have lots of point in times. In this example, I did happen to catch four bad ones, but the fifth and beyond, going back to the earlier snapshot, I have good data. So I have the opportunity to find good data to evaluate and then potentially recover my environment, either at a full system level or doing surgical extraction of data. If you were to encounter this in real life, which one would you pick? Well, I'd probably pick the one in the middle of my timeline if I had no information at all of when I might have had my corruption event. In a mainframe, it might be obvious. Maybe the sysplex goes into a wait state. Well, then you can obviously go back to a earlier snapshot that's close to it. But a name may not be that obvious, right? Of course, you pick one, um, you bring it up uh, through the link, you IPL it, take a look at it, you know, make a determination. Do you have to repeat or not, right? So again, ZDP is really important and powerful in terms of helping you to simplify the process of using the technology to protect your data. You know, 1,024 versions of the data. If you run at five minute intervals, that's 288 snapshots a day. If you size the environment with enough capacity, it's very easy to do one or two weeks of protection. And this thing scales. I got customers that run this on five arrays with over 30,000 volumes. Um, so it's quite scalable in terms of how it's able to protect data. So if you go back to the original example, the traditional approach of managing mainframe environments. So it's the exact same example. I got 100 terabyte I provision for mainframe usage. I'm only using 70 terabytes again for actual data. Um, if you notice here though, I now have snapshots on both sides, 1,024 snapshots available because of the automation for ZDP. What's different now though, is I'm only providing 150 terabytes of total capacity. So the change rates are the same, it's still only seven terabytes of change a day, 10%. Um, and if I run my snapshot uh, protection for like a week, for the course of a week, I only need around 42 terabytes or so of capacity. So what you have here is you have the ability to basically do business as usual DR protection, but you've added cyber recovery. 
You've added, you've added granular cyber recovery that can protect you for a week. And you're doing it in significantly less capacity than what we were doing in the past. If you remember in the original example, on the left side, I had 200 terabytes of capacity provisioned. On the right side, I had 300 terabytes of capacity provisioned. So I had a total of 500 terabytes. Well, now I'm doing it in a total of 300 terabytes. And I have everything I had before with DR, but I've added granular cyber protection capability. So if you build this out in an environment, this kind of gives you a high level block diagram of what it might look like. I got my primary data center, I got my DR site. A lot of cyber vaults are located in the primary data center. Um, locality of your data being close is a benefit. <laughs> Remember, you're not building for DR here, you're building for data recovery. So having it close to where you're running your business has some advantages, but you don't have to have it there. You can have it in the DR site and we have a number of customers that do it that way as well. If you notice here though, I have an air gap for FICON and network management, and I have my replication. Some customers allow replication to run continuously. Some customers will air gap that as well. But this is a pretty common, uh, depiction of what the infrastructure looks like. What's really, really common though, most of my main customers are building out virtual cyber vaults. So they're using their operational equipment for the cyber protection. The benefit here, one of the key benefits is obviously cost. You're using your operational gear to provide additional cyber protection. Why do some customers choose this? Well, because we have the secure snapshot feature, because the snapshots are immutable, uh, they, you know, they can't be accessed, they can't be changed. You know, we force retention. A lot of customers view that as providing the necessary security for um, this requirement. Obviously, if this is not enough protection, you can do a full air gapped vault. But a lot of customers find this very interesting. I can run the protection on either side, source or production, or it's production and DR. And of course, from a recovery point of view, um, I can do recovery from either side. The power of the recovery though, is I can instantly link the snapshot back and I can access it for recovery purposes. I don't have to copy data out. So that makes it very um, important in terms of re reducing the time for recovering from an event. You know, cyber event takes time. If you have a cyber event, the first thing you need to do is you gotta figure out what data you wanna use. And that's gonna take some time. And of course, after you make that determination what data you want, you want to be able to get it back in production quickly. Well, this type of technology here makes that recovery much faster once you make decisions. So a lot of customers though, um, basically are doing the, this type of implementation now with us. You know, so this is a physical example. So I got my production site, I got my DR site, I got primary storage, I got my virtual tape library. And then of course we introduce the cyber vault. Again, I can do it at the production site or the DR site. Of course, within the cyber vault, we're gonna recommend that you have an LPAR if possible. Um, if you have the LPAR in the cyber vault, you can run your daily protection automation there if you wish. Of course, if you have an LPAR in the cyber vault, you have the ability, um, again, manage the snapshots, but it also gives the ability to do um, analytics or, or triage of your data. So I can take a look at snapshots and I can activate them within the cyber vault environment to determine uh, is my data good or bad or, and so on. You know, I can look at catalog structures. Um, I could potentially bring up database instances and look at certain content in the database. Um, this is the area that's probably the most evolving part of cyber right now is how do you evac identify good data? How do you know if your data is good or bad? Well, in the cyber vault with a mainframe, one of the easiest ways to at least take a look initially would be the IP pellet and start all the subsystems similar to what you do with DR. But you might have to go further than that. And that's the area that we're working with um, our customers and other independent software providers to do. Um, the other option would be like I'm introduced earlier was the virtual cyber vault. So I got, I got my production environment, you know, disk and tape, I'm replicating it to DR. Um, I have maybe another LPAR that I use for the purposes of basically managing the vaulting environment. Of course, if you create another LPAR, you can have a wholly 
different set of credentials and such that you use to manage that environment, even though it's part of a larger environment. Again, within this capability here, you still have the ability to do the evaluation and, and, and take a look at your data and, and, and see if things um, are behaving properly or not. The clear benefit here is obviously less cost in building out a full cyber vault. So again, hopefully you see through our discussion, um, you know, recovery from logical corruption is evolving. It's really becoming the next phase of business continuity. Again, it has benefits for both um, operational errors as well as malicious attack or, or, or privilege insiders, you know, acting maliciously. Um, obviously you need to consider how your organization would, you know, plan and, and potentially implement responses to these type of threats. Um, we have some tools that are pretty powerful right now to take a look at the environment and you know, try to do some basic understanding if you have good data or bad data. Um, that's an area that there's still a lot of work to be done. I mean, take a take a close look at the at the tool space, especially around database uh, tool providers. Um, and I guess maybe the thing that's most interesting is if you could if you saw the power of the space efficiency, it really puts it in re reach of a lot of organizations that maybe maybe thought that cyber is really something you could entertain. So obviously, you know, take a look at it, think about cyber, is it really appropriate for your organization or not? And then obviously Dell's here, if you would like to talk to us, we would entertain and appreciate your uh, contact. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Um, if you have questions, I will uh, answer those. Thank you.